So, so let me ask you a couple of key questions that I've been meaning to ask you. Um, what is so different about, but you've been doing this a long time. You've, you've seen speaker companies come and go. You've talked to and have known many designers, many who are incredible thinkers, very innovative. Um, what makes Wilson Audio so unique compared to all of these wonderful people who have come and gone? Well, I think one thing that made it unique, and it's still an operative element, today and that is is that uh and and it's also one of the reasons why dave wilson was very attracted to hiring me to join the company and that is is that um dave as far as i know uh was the only loudspeaker design engineer that actually uh was an accomplished recording engineer and Dave was driven by the same musical language and passion that I am. Uh, and that is to say that uh, he was extraordinarily well-versed in the sound of strings, the sound of the human voice. Cheryl Lee, his wife, uh, was an extraordinary singer. And he recorded her many, many times, uh, singing all kinds of classical and pop repertoire. And um, he recorded many beautiful things like enormous concert organs at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, chamber music, uh, uh, piano soloist. Um, he, and many of those recordings remain, you know, as you mentioned uh, Desert Island. Several of those recordings would be on a Desert Island list by any standard. Um, and I think that he had a clear, in much the same way we go back to what I said earlier about Mark Levinson saying, if you want to be a master, you have to know the process. And I think that applies to a loudspeaker designer as well. You have to know the process of what happens when an acoustical sound goes through a microphone, through a recording chain, and what it should sound like when it comes out of a loudspeaker. Because you have in, in, uh, intimate testimony to the original. And that's something that I don't think any amount of test measurements, any amount of physical knowledge, uh, engineering skills can make up for if you don't have it. And I think that Dave was unique in that respect. Uh, I don't know of any other recording, uh, loudspeaker designers that have that, number one. Number two, Dave, uh, from the beginning, thought out of the box. He thought up answers to questions that nobody even thought to ask. And right from the very beginning, you know, back in the late 70s, when I visited him before um, he established Wilson Audio Systems, because uh, I actually went out to visit him in Novato where they lived, because as I mentioned, we'd become friends in the early 70s. Um, he, he developed a speaker called the WAM back then that addressed the, the concept of adjustable drivers in the time domain being able to move them. And uh, that struck me as wonderfully unique, utterly impractical in terms of how do you execute that, you know, in terms of something that somebody could put in their home. Back then, the way he did it was, it, thanks to Cheryl Lee and her tolerance, he literally had drivers hanging from the ceiling on strings, and he had ropes and pulleys going back to his listening position, and he could move them incrementally while listening until they aligned to the perfection. I mean, this is the kind of thing that, uh, and then he took that understanding and uh, a profound sense of uh, mechanical, innate mechanical engineering and learning how to build things uh, to the highest possible degree. And, and you know, they've always uh, maintained that uh, there's no detail too small that, you know, that you can ignore. The, the, the products that we make that he made then and today a result of uh, incredible attention to the smallest detail. Down to, for example, the screws that hold the drivers to the front baffle. They're not just stainless, they're austenetic stainless, which means that they're, you know, they're, they don't interact magnetically with the magnetic field of the, of the magnet on the drivers, you know, that are within four or five inches of them. That, that kind of thing, you know, well, an austenetic stainless steel screw is three times the price of a non-austenetic one. You know, so th these kinds of little details. The crossovers, there is no circuit board in our crossovers. 
all of the components are point to point. You know, one a capacitor goes to a resistor, which in turn goes to an inductor, which in turn goes to a coil. All of that point to point, then embedded in a block of epoxy so that it's held so that it can't vibrate. Whether you're talking about our WAM or our ceiling mount speaker, they're all built the same way. There's no wood in our loudspeakers. They're all man-made materials. We abandoned wood back in 96 um, and uh, uh, went to our own man-made materials and um, uh, gave them bizarre names like M material, X material, and, and nonsense like that. But there were reasons behind it. And uh, I won't bore you with all the, our, our, our machinations is how we came up with the names. but. The bottom line is that these are special materials specifically chosen for their sonic or their lack of resonant components. And uh, we were pioneers in that respect because back then everybody's making speakers essentially out of uh, MDF. Um, few exceptions, um, including Eggleston. We, we, we did it with MDF, but then we put these 50 pound slabs of granite on either side. And that was a good idea. And uh, that led to a lot of other things, but, uh, I'm not sure that they still do that at Eggleston. Maybe they do, I don't recall. But we did it back then. Um, the, the, uh, so there were a lot of really innovative things that were introduced back then. Then uh, he developed a team of like-minded fanatics. First it was him and his kids building them in his garage. Then they expanded into a uh, warehouse uh, in Novato and started building them then. And then they decided that they were, they're getting pretty serious at this. Um, they'd already undergone two bankruptcies before that, you know, just like Will, just like I did at, 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 at Eggleston, but I didn't want to continue on trying to push it. Uh, but Shirley and Dave did, they, 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 they knew that they had something and uh, they were out of sync financially at some point, but they figured out how to put things back together. And they found a piece of property in Provo, Utah that they were able to acquire. And this, we're now talking uh, 80s. And they bought a property there, moved everything from Novato to Provo into a factory, which a dedicated factory built from the ground up to do one thing and only one thing, manufacture loudspeakers. And to this day, that's all we do. You know, we remain uh, loyal and uh, focused on that. Um, and uh, we are blessed that Dave's first major assistant, who started as an assistant to Dave at five years of age, was Daryl. And Daryl accompanied his dad to recording sessions, sat through all of his dad's tedious experiments and measurement things and Daryl just simply absorbed it continue to absorb it and uh, and five years ago long before there was a trace of any illness in, uh, in Dave um, he appointed Daryl as the president and CEO of the company and head designer because Dave resigned from designing because he wanted to dedicate himself full-time to his magnum opus speaker which was the WAM and it took him five years to design that loudspeaker and during those five years, Daryl designed about eight new products that we brought out. Everything in the Wilson line today was designed by Daryl Wilson, which is interesting. And that's a testimony to how well he learned and how important the concept of succession is. And there isn't a day go by when, when all of us don't grieve for Dave and, and, and his untimely passing, which is going on two years now, mm -hmm. um, this month. Uh, no, next month, two years. It'll be two years next month in May. Um, and um, we, but on the other hand, we have, thank, thank God, we have Daryl, who has brought even newer concepts into the element of design. Daryl learned the sound of music and the passion for music. He's a little more attuned to popular music than his dad was far more liberal in his musical taste. And, and uh, his dad and I are all musical farts. I mean, we have a hard time dealing with, uh, uh, you know, I have a hard time with a lot of popular contemporary music, but I'm learning. Uh, 
And I'm learning through something called Tidal, which I find amazing because the world of music that I'm seeing that's out there, much of it incredibly well recorded, is, is, is fun. That along with what my sons have taught me. I have one son that is a very accomplished musician and, and his, his passion is indie rock. And uh, he's taught me a lot about certain indie musicians and uh, the quality of lyrics and songwriting and all of these things. So I think I've become a little bit more Catholic in my <laughs> musical taste than I was, let's say, two decades ago. I was very, I was a, I was a dogmatic jerk when it came to music, but uh, I'm a little less dogmatic, but still a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I wanted you to highlight two products in particular. Um, can we spend a couple of minutes and talk about the Wham, which is uh, David's uh, magnum opus? Uh, I I was very privileged to hear it just as he was releasing it for the very first time, and and it in many respects reminded me of the very first time I heard a pair of Whams. That sense of magic, the sense of being in in the presence of something that had never uh, had never been done before. Just just the sense of I don't even know how to describe it. This palpability, this this disappearing, and musicians being in front of you, and certainly lots of speakers disappear, and, and image, and, and so on. But that magic is something else. That that whatever it is, um, can you talk a little bit about the 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 Wham Chronosonic? And and I know you've done a lot of road trips with it. Um, uh, uh, that that is mind boggling, considering the logistics behind doing something like that. Right. Well, a lot of the road trips, really, most of them have been actually involved in the installation of it in the consumer's home. And I think that between myself and Bill Pugh, we probably installed over 10, maybe 15 pairs. I, I, I don't recall, uh, you know, around the world, some in Europe, uh, most of them in North America. And then uh, uh, I've actually also with Trent, we've installed a couple of three pairs in the Far East as well. Um, what I think is the basic ingredient that makes the Wham really distinguished, not only from all other loudspeakers, but even from models of our own, is simply this. As Dave would say, it's about time. That's why he called it the chronosonic. Chrono means time, sound. It's those two words that he put together as best he could to try and describe the basic concept behind the speaker. And what it's, and it goes back to what he was playing with, as I mentioned earlier, back in the late seventies with the original Wham. And the idea is that what you want to be able to do is maximize the potential in the time domain of the loudspeaker to suit not one, but any chosen listening height and listening distance from the speaker. And the way that works is you measure the height of the ear off the ground and you measure the distance from the ear from the basically where the speaker is placed in the room. And then we provide a whole table of charts that allow you to position each driver so that there is, for lack of a better, a synchronicity where all of the initial ictal responses of each individual driver that arrives at the precise listening point at the precise same time. Now, a lot of manufacturers can claim they can do that with manipulations by slightly angling the baffle and by, by manipulations of the, in the, in the phase in the crossover design. To a degree, all of that is true, but for only one position. You can't change what you've designed. And the idea behind what Dave did in that loudspeaker, and he's been doing it for a long time. We've been doing that in the various uh, Grand Slams, uh, in the X2, the, uh, the XLF, we do it in the Alex loudspeakers, we do it in the various versions of the Sasha 1, Sasha 2, and now the Sasha DAW. All of those have it, but to a lesser degree. And one of the things that really distinguished the Wham in the time domain is that it can be adjusted down to the realm of two microseconds. And that is two millionths of a second is where the arrival time of all of the drivers hits your ear at, at, at precise. And when that happens, 
it allows what has been captured by the microphones or the mic. It, uh, uh, it allows all of the structure and the harmonics of the, of the information that have been captured by the microphone in the recording process to be released as it went into the microphone, not to be released as is typically the case out of five or six drivers, which are all spaced apart and cannot possibly make all of those sounds arrive at the same time, unless you can physically move them relative to each other. So when that happens, when you have the chronosonic time delay, it's really a brain function. What happens is the brain, which is incredibly sensitive to time, it's why we as a species are still alive, uh, is the ability that we have. You know, it's a basic, I don't know if people know this, but the time domain function in the brain is a, is a different neurological function than the auditory uh, information that we get. Um, and one of the good things is Dave pointed out to me, and, and has also Bob uh, Stewart has pointed out the same thing, and others, as we get older, we suffer from, I forget the, ter the term, proboscis of the ear, where our heart frequency uh, hearing is diminished. Um, but the timing in our ability to discern time, meaning that when a twig is snapped behind us, we know exactly which way to look and in which way to run because that predator is going to kill us if we don't. You know what I'm saying? This is all part of the survival thing that's been programmed into our brain and our, our, our modality of function. That ability does not diminish at all through age. And it's one of the reasons I, I, I've come to terms with this is that, is that one of, it's one of the reasons why we get a little bit, I don't know, uh, a little bit less tolerant of time smear in recordings as we get older because we start to lose some of the high frequency information but with the loss of that and the combination of time smearing, the sound becomes more irritating and, and you become less patient and your brain has to work harder to put those pieces together. When the timing is rendered back intact, the brain relaxes and the music becomes more beautiful. And as you experience, Adrian, when a voice comes out of a wham, it springs out of the speaker in precise three-dimensional focus separate and apart from all the other things that are happening out of the speaker at the same time. And that's what is magical. Um, and that is what makes the wham, well, I was going to say utterly unique, but it's no longer the case because Daryl developed another loudspeaker. So now that brings us to the topic, uh, the last topic I wanted to cover, which is after the wham, what happened next? Well, what happened is this, a couple of things. Uh, the goal, and the goal still is with the WAM, we've sold probably half of the ones that we intend to ever build. We've got a couple of three pairs in production. Um, things, of course, uh, you know, our ability to deliver and install them is, is, uh, is limited right now because of the shutdown. Um, we're not allowed to go out into people's homes and, and, and those speakers do require a team from Wilson that consists of me and Bill or others that we might designate. But the reality is, is that we're not in a position to deliver and install them. Um, but from the beginning, the concept of the WAM was that it, Dave uh, had dictated and we intend to honor uh, the, the, uh, the concept. It's going to only build 70. And it was going to be a special product that was not going to be sold through, well, it's going to be sold through dealers, but most of the demos have taken place either in homes of people who have them or at the factory where they're set up for, for that purpose, for demonstration and enjoyment. Um, but two things emerged that uh, became somewhat uh, obvious to Daryl, and that is, the size, the main tower of the WAM is, um, well, Daryl is six feet, four inches tall. And the WAM was literally 10 inches taller than he is. So uh, I guess that makes it, what, seven feet, uh, two inches tall, really. Uh, and the problem we ran into in a lot of rooms, particularly in the Far East, uh, 
and in a lot of domestic. It's just too damn big. People really, even if they had the financial resources and the desire, the speaker was too tall to function at its best in many, many rooms. So we wound up installing it in a lot of dedicated rooms. That's not to say that I've had some highly successful installations of the WAM in rooms that you normally wouldn't think, but if the dimensions of the room are good and, and if the speakers can actually fit, then, they, then they'll produce great sound. Um, a room that I did them in, in uh, Burling, uh, Burlington, North Carolina, uh, Burlington, California, this, uh, it, was, it was funny. Uh, when we turned them on for the first time, I'm sitting there with the client, you know, because he, he knew he wanted them. He knew he had to have them because he'd heard them in a, in a, in a beautiful room that was dedicated, purpose-built for those speakers. And he decided, I'm going to get these. And so when we turned them on, um, and uh, he listened, and I look over to Sally, and uh, his, his face is all in tears. I said, what's the matter? Oh, no, no, Peter, I'm crying from joy. Oh, good. You like them, don't you? Oh, of course I like them, but what, I, what, what I'm so joyful is I don't have to buy another house. <laughs> <laughs> we got them to work in a small room because <laughs> he was prepared to move. <laughs> he was prepared to go wherever it is he had to, but he's prepared to stay now where the speaker. Anyway, but we did run into that problem, that the speakers are big. And um, the WAM currently retails. Uh, with the, these master chronic sonic subwoofers, they're eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a pair. So those are two major obstacles: the price and the size. And Daryl set about trying to design a loudspeaker that would do homage to what his father had created, and pack as much of the design advantages of the WAM into a slightly smaller and far more affordable package. And um, he succeeded in doing that. It's now what we call the uh, XVX. And we also have a dedicated pair of woofers that could be bought with it. Although the majority of the ones I've sold thus far have been sold on their own because they were, they're, they're quite extraordinary. I mean, they do have base energy going down into the low 20s, uh, real energy. Um, but the XVX is 10 inches shorter than the WAM, the tower portion. Um, it's $329,000 a pair. So it's substantially less than half of the, of the, almost a third of the price of the big one. But what is not compromised is it does have the time domain correction capability down to two microseconds. It has the same timing capability that his bigger brother does. And the reason we were able to get it smaller was is that Daryl eliminated one driver. It's still a four-way, but it doesn't have the two sevens. It has one seven, one five, the tweeter. It has a rear-firing tweeter, which the WAM has a rear-firing tweeter and mid-range. Um, it, it, it has the same base drivers, but in a smaller enclosure. Um, the WAM has is capable of slightly greater scale and dynamic impact, but the but more than most people probably would ever need. The WAM could go in a very large room, which is how it's, it's how you heard it in Dave's room, and you saw that it, it could pressurize that room effortlessly. Um, the XVX, uh, you you might want to go back and hear it now in the same room. You'd be amazed at how good it is. Um, and uh, that speaker uh, has really caught on. It, it is, and plus, uh, Adrian, it's a product that we're offering as a production speaker. Uh, we now have in North America 14 dealers that actually have that loudspeaker on display. And um, the and hopefully someday we'll have a pair in uh, as soon as this is lifted, you can come yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. You got, and I'll come up and we'll, I think, and then we'll do an event because I think you'd, be, you'd find them to be truly, truly extraordinary. The, the reality is, is that they're, uh, they're selling, you know, uh, even despite the virus, we've sold two pair, even with the shutdown, um, people, you know, with the momentum that we built. 
Um, but we've already sold way more of them than we've sold of the, uh, of the, of the WAM. Um, and the reality is, is that it is a truly, truly stupendous speaker. Um, there will be a forthcoming review, I think, possibly in the absolute sound in the July or August issue. Um, and um, Stereophile will be reviewing them at some point in the near future as well. And uh, um, I would say that, oh, and I'm a, see the room that the space you see behind me, um, before I pass, I will have a pair of them in this room. That, that's my desire. Um, I must own them, you know, and, and I knew that because, uh, and I knew, and, you know, she who must be obeyed, the first time we heard them, uh, and she's very familiar with this system, and there's nothing wrong with my Alexias and my subwoofers, but I played a couple of my own recordings and, uh, in MQA, and she leans over and says, Peter, we have to have these. We have to have these. And I've decided that I do. I do have to have them. And someday I will, you know. So, yeah, they're, they're extraordinary. 